Hey, what's up? It's episode 131, Pain Points of Wealth. And we have a very special guest on the show to speak about the labor market. Everyone knows the labor market's been hot, will continue to be hot, but we have Eric Sigerson on today. He co-leads the technology officer's practice for Russell's Reynolds Associates. He has spent the last 30 years recruiting and placing senior execs in the IT space and is really on the pulse of what's happening in the job market, tech market specifically. And we're going to talk about some of our true and tried investment philosophies that you want to apply to your financial freedom independence plan. Check it out. We got a phenomenal show. First off, Eric, thanks for being on the show. We really appreciate it. And, you know, maybe tell us a little about yourself and you know, how did you get started in the recruiting field? I feel like you've been doing it quite a long time. So yeah. uh, tell us from the beginning. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So first of all, no one grows up thinking they're going to be a headhunter. Uh, I went to school to be a computer science guy. I got into sales with IBM where I spent 11 years uh, and then realized that uh, I really enjoyed being in the executive suite at a lot younger age than I was being allowed to inside IBM. So executive search provided me with the opportunity to help clients with their talent challenges. And so uh, almost 30 years ago, as you mentioned, I, I joined Russell Reynolds, did broad technology recruiting for the first 10 years, and the last 18 or 19 have been focused exclusively on recruiting chief information officers, technology officers, digital officers across all industries. So basically you know, big wigs in the tech industry yeah. for the most part. Yeah, yeah, it's mainly tech within a broad set of companies with a little bit of work in the tech industry itself, right? So it's more the technologists working for financial services firms, for insurance companies, for retailers, et cetera. It's certainly a role that's uh, become more and more important uh, as each year goes by. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, you know, it used to be such a small percentage of spending back in the 80s when I started. <clears throat> and here today, you know, if you're a, uh, a bank, you're spending 30, 35 percent of revenues on wow. your financial, on your technology footprint. Well, it's kind of amazing, too, like because uh, before I worked at Payne Capital Management, I worked in the disaster recovery space. So, you know, when you go to some of these places, you wouldn't just have a, a chief technology officer, but you'd have a, an offset of that. You'd have like a chief recovery officer. I mean, you're seeing a lot of that, too, where it's just like the roles have completely expanded. Yeah, they have. They've gotten a lot broader. You know, we didn't have a chief data officer 10 years ago. We didn't have a chief digital officer until, you know, five or six years ago. So those are all terminology to help reflect specialization. Uh, and, you know, companies are having to evolve to embrace technology as a strategic asset. Now, that's a great point. And, you know, what I'm curious about, too, is like we've all we hear about is, look, unemployment's extremely low. Um, a lot of the naysayers out there say, well, just give us some time. You know, at some point, the labor market's going to start to weaken. Um, obviously, tech has gone through a lot of turmoil over the course of the last year or so. You know, we see a lot of layoffs there. Um, but, you know, we're, as you know, with our podcast and our, our view is uh, typically a little more rosy than the average, uh, maybe, uh, prognosticator on Wall Street. So what are you seeing right now in the labor market? Like, is, is it hot? Is it not hot? You know, yeah. where are you seeing you know, the, the real action. Well, as, well. as you mentioned, I mean, we saw a big correction in the tech industry itself with a lot of jobs being taken out earlier this year, late last year, based on over hiring during COVID. So companies had been able to reduce their expenses substantially during the pandemic that afforded them to, to hire aggressively as things or the perception that things were going to weaken, they started to, to take people out and almost get back to more of a normal. I think across the tech role inside other industries, it's remained relatively robust. Uh, I've always said going into the 0708 crisis, I said, if you weren't happy with your chief information officer going into a recession, you're probably unlikely to get any happier during the recession. <laughs> so you saw changes taking place, replacements, upgrades occurring, even when times may have been a little challenging. So. What we've seen this year is a continued focus on quality, a continued focus on having the right tech leader who knows how to um, drive kind of a product-oriented 
uh, mindset and how they implement technology within companies. Uh, and, and they're doing it at the top level. It's just, there has been, you know, a little bit of a softening from 01 and 21 and 22, but we still see a fairly, fairly robust market for, for the top tech leaders. And Eric, you know, just to, with everybody starting to work from home, you know, you're starting to hear about people going back to the office. Yeah. You know, how, how has that affected, um, you know, the types of people that you're recruiting and, you know, has that made your job more challenging? Yeah, I mean, I think I, when we went, when the pandemic first hit, uh, it took off the table the single biggest impediment to getting leaders to change jobs, which is relocation. Relocation has always been the hardest thing yes, that's great impeded point. people from being able to move from company to company. So with the pandemic, all of a sudden companies relaxed the need for relocation, which allowed more movement. And we knew at some point that we were going to revert, maybe not back to the way it was in 19, but back more towards the center. And so um, people that may have moved in 21, 22 are realizing companies are saying, hey, we want you back in the office. I can think of a large quick service restaurant chain, for example, that said, hey, we are in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You need to be here. And by the way, if you don't live here, you're getting here on your nickel, not ours. So wow. all of a sudden, the, the landscape's changing and people are having to be more serious about, well, maybe I do need to relocate or find another job where I live. So what you're saying is maybe Chris can't stay on Maine for the whole month of uh, August and he should come back to the office. Eric, I like this. <laughs> like, this is, this is really good. Yeah, just don't talk to me about being in Naples in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well, no, it's, it's an interesting perspective because I think, you know, you're probably going to go somewhere in the middle maybe, right? So it's not like 100% in the office because I think, you know, COVID did teach us that like, hey, a lot of things can be done remotely that used to be traditionally Right. You had to be in the office for like the thing that blew my mind is, you know, we'd always have to meet clients face to face for them to become clients. And we had so many people during COVID that maybe heard us from somewhere, never met us face to face. Uh, we did everything over Zoom and end up working with us, which would have never happened before COVID. Now that's just like a very, very common practice where we don't have to meet people physically in an office. Right. And they're still willing to work with us. And I have to imagine that probably you can extrapolate that out to lots of different industries. Yeah, I think. What I've learned from this is now that we've gotten to this new normal of being much more remote, when you do get face to face, it makes a difference. When we sit across yes. the table from a client, uh, like we did this week with a large uh, industrial, $10 billion industrial company, new opportunities come out of that because we're sitting across the table from them. Mm -hmm. When you're on a Zoom call, they might be doing email, they might be checking their schedule for the rest of the week, they might be looking at their vacation plans while they're talking to you. You cannot multitask when you're in person with somebody. You can when you're on a Zoom call. Like, you know, right now I could be looking away, but I'm not. <laughs> so it does require you to focus. There's no replacement for in person, but you're right. There's a lot of improvements and in, in efficiencies to be gained by not having to commute every day to the office. You know, I think um, Ryan and Chris have both said it more than once on this podcast. If you don't go visit your client, somebody else will. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's great for, you know, the businesses we're in. But what about, are they having a hard time getting their employees to come in? I mean, what are you hearing from, you know, the folks that you're hiring in terms of motivating, you know, the sales force and the workforce? Yeah, it's it's hard to get, once, once that genie left the bottle, it's really hard to get it back in. And the idea of five days a week is, is almost off the table. They're yeah. just hoping for two to three days a week in the office. And, and the, the smarter companies are those that are, are uh, orchestrating that in such a way that you're in the office at the same time <laughs> so that you're <laughs> together. Nothing worse than showing up at the office and being there by yourself and sitting in a cubicle on Zoom calls all day. So it, it does require some thinking and planning and strategizing. And I think um, and the, the people who have been hurt the most through this uh, change in, in work style is our kids, you know, coming out of college. 22, yes. 23. Um, think about how our lives were shaped by going to the office every day and being in person and running, you know, when you had a question going next door and and having it just available to you and then going out for drinks afterwards uh, and seeing people socially and, and that whole experience is gone is by, gone by the wayside. And it's really hurting uh, those those uh, young adults who are trying to learn what culture is and learn what good work ethic is. Uh, yes. 
you know, they're not getting trained the way we were all trained. Yeah, That's I just true. think, you know, listening to an experienced person in an industry, you know, just eavesdropping, right? Sitting in the office next door, sitting in the same cubicle. You just, you know, you start to imitate that. You learn what works, what doesn't work. It doesn't happen remotely. And I right. think that's that's a really good thing. I mean, point. think about it. At the end of the day, you know, you look to the left, you look to the right. That's how you learn. Um, hey, uh, it's 5 o'clock. The day's over. Do I walk out the door? But, gosh, everyone's still here. They're still working, you know. <laughs> and We're pretending to work. Of, you know, before <laughs> your boss leaves. You remember that whole feeling? Um, yeah. yeah. It's just a It's just a different environment. Yeah, no, it's true. And then you've seen it in the numbers, productivity. And I mean, I can attest to this. I'm not as productive from home, for sure. It's just like when you separate kind of church and state, like you're at right. the office, you get your work done, you go home. And it's it, it's a separate, there's a delineation there. I think when you don't have that, I think it becomes hmm. kind of murky with how your work ethic becomes. And I think too, like, I don't know if you see this, but like the younger generation, I imagine they yearn to go to the office. Cause I think in here in New York city, like you have these, they're living in these small apartments. <laughs> they're working there all day. Um, they're not going into an office and like, you know, that's, that's their life. I think that's gotta be kind of hard if you're just out of college and you're living in a big city like New York or something yeah. like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we've got twin, 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 26 year old boy, girl twins that are both consultants and he goes into the office three or four days a week just for the hope of seeing people. Um, wow. You know, she goes in maybe once a week uh, just because, you know, her client situation is a little bit different. So it's just it really has hurt them. And, and I do agree. I don't think we look at the commute time as being a negative. There is a positive side around this buffer where it helps you sort of uh, decompartmentalize, you know, what you've been working on, kind of get ready for the evening and disconnect uh, versus today. How many of us, you know, might take a break at 4.30 and then 6.30, 7.30, you're back online and you're continuing to work and, and that line blurs. Yeah, it totally does, but I have a couch in the office so I can take a nap here. <laughs> yeah, and it always That's annoys me, good. Eric, in Naples when you can't meet me for happy hour because you have to do a client conference call. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you gotta, you gotta manage that schedule a little better. Um, <laughs> and I can see on like on a C-suite level, uh, like their critical few objectives could be adjusted or, you know, that could be part of the uh, bonus, you know, based on how many days they come to the office. They're using that uh, carrot and stick yeah, approach with a lot of these folks. This is a very interesting question. So uh, Felice and I, my wife, had dinner with our CEO last night and his wife, who's Greek, and we're heading to Greece in next month. So he was giving us some tips. And uh, he was quoting uh, badge in data <laughs> by office around the world for our firm. And so certainly leadership is looking at that kind of information. Um, some companies, very few, are using it as a stick. Most of them are trying to be more encouraging about it. Um, some are saying, like, there's a large accounting firm that said, hey, it will impact your bonus next wow. spring. So yeah. be mindful of that. Um, I think there's going to be a big testament come September 1st, as we come into the fall, there are a lot of companies that are saying, hey, it's going to be different this fall. We want you back in the office and we meet it this yeah. time. And <laughs> so we'll see because unemployment is still so low. Yes, that was my question. Uh, yeah, we still have the power. Yeah. And in, unless and again, trust me, I don't want to see this scenario where we have eight, nine percent unemployment. But if and when we get to that position, the worker will say, well, I'm not coming in. They'll go, well, great. Just don't bother coming in at all. <laughs> you know, yeah. Find somebody else to do your job. Well, I think one of the other problems, too, and I'm, you're seeing this or not, but it's just demographics. I mean, the biggest issue in the United States is, I use a stat all the time, but you have 2 million baby boomers retiring every year. Yeah. Um, you know, birth rates have slowed drastically, and that takes like 20 years for that to even impact the labor market. Are you seeing that shrinking labor pool? becoming more problematic as baby boomers leave the workforce and they can't be replaced and we have a huge number of job openings. Welcome generative AI. I mean, yeah. it's going to replace a lot of those jobs that were potentially filled by knowledge workers who have retired. And so you have this kind of yin and yang going on around using technology to fill those roles. There are many industries that are gonna be dramatically impacted by uh, the concepts of chat, GBT, legal, healthcare, financial services, to be to name a few, our, our industry will be impacted. I don't know if it'll be disrupted, yeah. 
like legal industry will be, but I think that will help um, fill in for some of the gaps that may exist, but it won't give up some of the, um, the, the deep knowledge base that some of these retiring workers have, subject matter experts yeah. that are retiring. And it, it's hard to sell how that's all gonna play itself out. Yeah, well, I, I think two comments on that. First off, I don't think generative, uh, generative AI could replicate Bob's hair, but that's, you know, that's years away. <laughs> But, but secondly, um, I think that's the, the, the right conversation. The conversation is, and AI is going to replace all our jobs, is we desperately need AI to help us with our labor shortage. That's right. a way bigger problem than worrying about all our jobs going away. And I think like that's the wrong conversation to have right now. Right. Like we, we're going to need you know, to fill in the gaps one way. Yeah. And you another. might argue that combination of that and uh, a revised immigration policy. I mean, you yes. see this all the time the best some of the best talent in the world isn't sitting in the united states we need to be more open-minded to letting people into our across our borders who can help add to our gdp and um to restrain that based on policy is just i think short-sighted they'll be forced to change it because the labor shortage is real that's my opinion when the fires uh, under your uh yeah. end so to speak you know you're gonna have to have a bipartisan <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, view on that at some point. I think a hundred percent. Well, we know, but based on history, that Washington doesn't move until it's right on the brink. So, right, it's gonna have to be a crisis before we uh, we see any any help from the DC. That's for sure. Exactly. All right. Well, most important question, which I didn't actually put on your questions, Eric, because I sure. want to give you a curveball here. But we ask all our guests this: What album, when you heard it for the first time, changed the way? You view, uh, you view the world and why? What album? I've, I'm, I'm going to have an answer for this. Yeah, I, I didn't want you to prepare ahead of time. That's how I knew you would. Yeah, I, I absolutely. And I know you love music because we've talked about it. I do love music. And I know you love music. Um, and you, I know you were in a band. Uh, Several bands, B level bands, but yes. yes. So I'm just <laughs> trying to think of the Billy Joel tune. It's the first one that came up when I had my brand new album uh, that I, on my first stereo, and it was, um, I can sing it, let me think it's from, but it Don't was- Don't be shy, you can sing it. No, <laughs> it was, um, let's give me a second. You scheduled an hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's got a now great, we got it now. It it's like got a great uh, flugelhorn solo. Oh, you know, it's going to, I'll just say it's Billy Joel. I mean, it, it, Joey, Billy Joel, the stranger, loved it. it was what 70s. was it about the album? Like, what no, was it? Just, it, just, it, it just hit me. It's a great, look, I was always someone who appreciated someone's voice, and he had a great voice. Plus, he had a jazz-like sound to a rock album. And so I always appreciated that because I kind of grew up, I'm a tenor sax player. My whole family was in the music business. Uh, my brother's a Juilliard cellist. My dad was a professional flutist. And so um, I just love jazz. And then to bring that kind of flair and musicianship into a rock album, I just love. No, it's a cool combination. I feel like you might have been a Steely Dan fan in the 70s, love, too. Love the Dan. <laughs> yes, yeah, saw them early when they, they were a studio uh, band for a long time. I saw them on their first tour, which was New York Rock and Soul Review, which was uh, with uh, with Donald Fagan and Walter Becker touring, oh, absolutely. Amazing. I mean, I I was all over that. In fact, going next weekend to see final tour of Kenny Loggins, he's making the Swan Song in Ravinia. Wow, um, just he's just fabulous. So I'm I'm really I'm really psyched. I've been blessed to hear a lot of great musicians. <clears throat> We've had a lot of Billy Joel uh, inspiration on this mm -hmm. uh, podcast. Really? Yeah, yeah, not the first. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're in New York. I'm trying to, I'm trying to fashion my comments appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eric, thank you very much. This has been a great uh, insight to what's going on in the labor market. We appreciate you taking your time today. Uh, it's been, been great to get some insights and, and catch up with you, man. Thank you all. It's great hearing you all, and, and look forward to seeing you guys in person soon. Great. Right. Thanks, Eric. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 131, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you've saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, 
Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan. We'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We go through everything. There's no other firm out there that will do this work up front. We literally build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement, how to draw from your portfolio, how to take Social Security, how to factor in inflation without running out of money, a dynamic income plan so you can stay retired. We're going to look at diversification. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo the last two years as market has been all over the place? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do? We're going to put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether they're annuities, mutual funds, insurance products, brokerage products, structured products. We're going to do a deep dive of every investment you own, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, so I thought we could review some of our top, what I would call planning and investing rules that we've come up with, really the tenets of our firm, Pain Capital Management, of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, uh, over the course of the 15 years we've been in business and our collective 70 years of experience. And you know, one thing we've learned over time is higher returns typically mean higher risk. Yeah, no, it's just amazing. I, I spoke to a client literally yesterday uh, who has a good friend of his is starting a company and he's wanting to borrow money. And he's a couple of million dollars and he doesn't want to go to venture capital. The bank won't lend him the money. And he says, you know, I can pay you 12%. And my client said, well, do you think there's any risk there? And I said, yeah, I mean, he's, that's not the return. <laughs> that's what they're borrowing money from you. They're, they're, they're borrowing money at 12%. I mean, when you can't borrow at four or five like everybody else, you know, that number tells you it's extraordinary risk. Uh, so it's I think when it comes to, you know, r rates of return that are quoted, it's pretty easy to assess, you know, how much risk is involved. And a lot of folks don't see that. Yeah. Or how about I, I looked at a fund a couple of years ago for a prospect and uh, it was paying a 10 percent dividend. And then when we actually peeled it back, it turned out about. 6% of that was return of capital. Yeah, I mean, you got to re read the fine print. I mean, even now with, you know, this year, we've talked about technology and growth doing so well. Um, and it's done well for a very, very long time. So you see a lot of concentration in all the big mega cap names, which have had a really great return. Well, guess what? We saw this last year. The downside can be pretty ugly, too. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. So it should always be a red flag when your returns are so good, uh, you know, especially when you put it in context of how other investments have done. And it might be time to look at the risk in your portfolio. Most of us think, well, it's doing great. I'll just add more money there, which is like the worst thing you can do. Well, the biggest yeah, problem I have is we're long-term investors, right? We're used to seeing investments go up. We're like the, uh, the tortoise, not the hare, right? We don't care about day-to-day -day volatility. We like that slow and steady growth. So when you know, one of our clients or friend comes to us with this you know, new idea, this hot new idea, um, they don't understand the risk. Like, you know, what if I put 25000 into this new issue? It's no big deal. It's only 25000 Until they're down 25000 then it's a big deal. You know, so it's, it's sometimes hard for, I think, people who don't pay attention to this all the time to, to understand how much risk there is inherently in a single idea. Yeah, or like how about those funds that use leverage? You know, they'll say like, oh, look at the, this S&P 500 three times leverage fund. It's up three times the S&P 500. But the, what they don't realize, to your point, Dad, is if it goes the other way, they're down three times as much. Yeah, that, that's the that's the problem, right? Is uh, it's Bob likes to say risk is only known in hindsight. So you really have to kind of do a, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, putting your portfolio in this stress test, like what if this happens? What happens to your portfolio and so on and so forth? And I think most of us don't do that. But proactive risk management is better than reactive for sure. You know, the other philosophy or tenant that we have at our firm is planning over prophecies. And you know you always have those naysayers talking about apocalypse. Now it's coming, recession, hyperinflation. You know we were meeting with a prospective client the other day, a referral from one of our largest clients, and they said, "Well, under this planning process, what what other approaches are there?" And I said, "Well, you could go by euphemisms and slogans. I mean, that's what a lot of people <laughs> do, um, but we don't recommend that. We think 
Following a planning-based approach makes it so much easier to understand what you own and then, more importantly, know why you own it. Yeah, it always seems like that these uh, these great investments, you know, are always the one that had the most advertisement. Like when when crypto was so big, you know, there was always like these big ads for FTX and and Bitcoin. It's kind of like, well, if you really have to advertise it, like, is it really that great? That's a great point. I mean, that's where gold. I mean, how many people own gold? It's, gold's been a horrible investment, right? I mean, you just look at it on a chart and you would say, I would never own gold. Yet gold is sold <laughs> every year. Those gold commercials go on. People always say, oh, I've got a couple of gold bars over here. Because they've been sold on the idea of like the dollar is going to be debased, right? The world's going to fall apart and we're all of a sudden, all we're going to care about is owning gold. Meanwhile, I think I'd rather own a gun if it's apocalypse now, not gold, just saying. I don't know, right? When I started this industry, guys, almost 50 years ago, I think the average annual rate of return on gold is like 1%, while the average <laughs> annual rate of return on equity has been 10%. And I love these commercials. Why would you want those horrible returns from equities when you could own gold? I mean, what are they talking about? <laughs> I don't know. I always like those commercials where they uh, they advertise the patriotic aspect of it. Only one of those patriotic <laughs> coins. That always gets me. <laughs> You're not a real patriot unless you own a gold, you know, Statue of Liberty, silver or gold or silver coin. Yeah. If we etch something patriotic inside the uh, in, in, inside the bullion, for some reason, that's going to make it worth more. I, I just don't get it. Um, you know, the other the other big issue that we see all the time is diversification over concentration. Right. I mean, how many times and I've talked about this. A lot lately, because we see a lot of different portfolios are just overladen with Amazon, Google, Apple, Facebook, the S&P 500. And, you know, what happens is, again, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But that overconcentration is always a problem on the downside. It always is, because it's kind of like, um, you know, these declines, they happen slowly. Just paraphrase a famous author. They happen so slowly and then suddenly. Right. So, you know, it goes yeah. up. As I said the other day, like you're on an escalator, right? One step at a time, slow, you know, slow um, approach to the upside. And then, wow, the downside is you're in an elevator shaft. And if you think you're going to catch that, right, you're going to catch that falling knife and, and get out before it happens, you're sadly mistaken. Well, Bob, I think you said this line. I'm definitely paraphrasing, but it's like concentration can be the fastest way to create wealth, but also the fastest way to destroy wealth. And I think that's the problem. Like you pick a stock and you do really well with it. And you're saying, well, I'm not going to sell. I made this big bet and I was right. Well, eventually you could be dead wrong. And I think you're going to see that. Like you saw that when the 90s, when the tech bubble burst, all the, the Cisco's of the world, Oracle, you name it, all those stocks that just did so well, people just rode them up, but then they rode them down. And I think you could have the same problem today. Well, you're seeing it now. I mean, especially with like the AI stocks, like NVIDIA, for example, you know, everybody's talking about, we got to get into AI. It's got ways to run, but you know, at the same time, it's trading at 62 times forward earnings. So it's, you know, the likelihood is that's not going to be the darling of the future. It might be, but, you know, there's other things that have more value. I think this illustrates it better than anything. You know, the, the, the famous ARC fund, you know, that's in, in, invested in all this innovative, disruptive technology. If you take the day that went public when they first offered it a couple of years ago, and then you measure it against small to mid-sized industrial companies like old American companies, right? Small to mid-sized industrial companies are outperforming the ARC fund. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's great when you, it catches your attention when something goes up 189% in one year. You don't think about, uh, you're not in it, right? When you're buying it up 189%, there's nothing but downside. So it's, it's, you know, when you're in these riskier investments, you know, it's great for cocktail parties. It's horrible, you know, for your financial health, well-being. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, the average annual return of the S&P 500 was 10% a year from 1990 to 2022, excluding dividends. The biggest return of any single stock in one year since 1980 was Qualcomm, which is a, definitely a name from the past, Bob, you remember that name, in 1999. It went up a mind-numbing 2,620% in one year. The second biggest one-year gainer of all time was Tesla. In 2020, was up 743%. But man, oh man, that pales in comparison to what Qualcomm did in 1999. Well, you know what? You guys nailed it the other day when you said that uh, the problem with these financial news channels is that they talk about the same five stocks all the time. And if you go back 20 years, 25 years, I mean, every day they were talking about Qualcomm to the point where 
when when every day they had somebody going Qualcomm, Qualcomm, you know, it was like this. It was so obnoxious, and that's all they <laughs> talked about. And you know, I had a individual that I trained that actually worked for another firm. Um, he, you know, he when he when he worked with me, he, and he went off to another firm. He had a he had a physician who took his entire pension, his personal accounts, liquidated everything he had with his advisor, and put it into Qualcomm. You know, after it was already up two thousand percent. And, you know, the rest of this history wiped themselves out. But it's just amazing how the financial media grabs onto a concept and makes you believe that's the only thing you should ever think about. Yeah. And meanwhile, whatever the great companies of the future, nobody's talking about. And this is why you want to diversify, because if you own a passive index, invariably, it's good. They're, they're going to show up in your portfolio magically. <laughs> you know, like they're going to they're going to be there. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes is anticipation, as we always say, is a horrible investment strategy. Because you just don't know where the returns are going to come from in the future. If we really knew, we'd be on our yachts. And all those uh, prognosticators on TV, if they really knew, they wouldn't be telling us. So, food for thought. <clears throat> all right, Chris, since we're talking about the labor market today, in the United States, there were about 75 workers available for every 100 job openings as of July of this year. While states like New Jersey and California have more workers than they know what to do with, you go to places like North Dakota, they only have 0.35 workers available for every 100 jobs, potentially tipping the balance of where job seekers should probably go. Um, there's a lot of workers needed, but just not in the places that you think. Well, you know what, guys? I think uh, if it doesn't work out here, I think I'm going to pack my bags and head up to North Dakota. Plus, you know, for the, those of you that live in California, New Jersey, I think the taxes are a lot cheaper in North Dakota. Well, God knows, Chris, you like to travel and not be in the office. <laughs> <laughs> Take care to my brother. Hey, Chris, there's, 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 I'm here. There's plenty I'm of coastline the in North Dakota to, to, you know, to float your boat. <laughs> <laughs> they've got rivers too <laughs> <laughs> river sailing you could start a new trend uh well another great show thanks for listening thanks for watching this is episode 131 pain points of wealth if you like our podcast love it please give us that five star ratings on itunes leave us a comment there if you would tell everyone how great we are if this is on spotify you can actually subscribe to the channel if this is youtube right now you're watching you can like the episode subscribe to our channel Click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.